Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Back to Basics, College Students Experiencing Homelessness. We're going to be starting in just a minute. All right, again, um, welcome to our webinar today. Thank you all for joining us. Before we get started, I'm just going to go over a little bit of housekeeping. This PowerPoint can be downloaded in the handout section. And also, if you need to stop out during part of the webinar, webinar, this webinar is being recorded and archived and will be available on our website in a few days um, or emailed to you by the end of this day. Feel free to ask questions throughout the PowerPoint. Um, you can see how to do so on the slide right here, and we'll get to your questions throughout the presentation and at the very end. My name is Jillian Sitar, and I am the Higher Education Program Manager at Schoolhouse Connection. My background is actually in higher education and student affairs, specifically in housing, so I feel for many of the higher ed professionals that are joining us today, um, as you're working on college campuses during these unprecedented times. Uh, one of the main responsibilities that I have is to learn what institutions around the country are doing to support students experiencing homelessness. So please read re if you want to learn a little bit more about the work that I'm doing and also share what you're doing on your campus to support this population. A little bit about Schoolhouse Connection. We are a national organization based in Washington, D.C with a mission to overcome homelessness through education, starting from birth all the way to post-secondary. Our work encompasses both the practice piece as well as policy. So feel free to check out our website listed on the slide where we have a ton of resources, including our other archive webinars, guides, implementation tools, and sign up for our weekly newsletter where you can get all of this information directly to your mailbox. Today, we're gonna to go over a pretty introductory level about college student homelessness and provide a really brief overview of different services and resources colleges and universities offer this distinct population. And we'll hear from one of the leading institutions, Kennesaw State University, to hear about their amazing program and how they've responded to supporting the students in light of the coronavirus. Many of you already know the value of higher education, but some of the reasons are listed here on this slide. Basically, a high school degree just isn't what it used to be a few years ago. Post-secondary education is necessary to have a job that pays enough to afford stable housing. It doesn't help that the cost of tuition has really skyrocketed the last few decades. A public four-year institution costs over $10,000 more than it did in the 1970s. Private colleges have doubled. Community colleges have tripled in cost. And unfortunately, federal Pell Grants haven't been able to keep up with the cost. Less money is being awarded and it's not covering the same extent as it used to. And we also expect that the coronavirus is gonna have a really large impact on enrollment and retention rates. Recent reports and polls have found that about one in six students of four-year college-bound students appear to be at the point of giving up at the idea of attending a college or a university in the fall. And from a survey of over 1,000 high school seniors, 69% of the students foresee that the virus is going to impact their higher education financial situation. We might see an increase of summer melt where students are changing their decisions to attend college in the fall. They might be switching to a local community college rather than a four-year institution to be closer at home and have a lower cost of attendance. We've created a COVID-19 page and resources and we're going to link that on the chat box. But we also have included a higher education resource that we did in collaboration with the Hope Center and Juvenile Law Center, a frequently asked question document that is consistently updated with questions that we're getting from our inbox, but also in our virtual chat webinars that we host every other Thursday. And more information, again, can be found on that um, link that's on the chat box as well as on the slide. 
So to start us off, we just wanted to talk about what homelessness can look like. So many college students might have actually experienced homelessness with their family. Um, homelessness among unaccompanied youth is actually commonly caused by severe family dysfunction, including abuse, neglect, abandonment, parental substance, and our mental illness that might be exacerbated by poverty. And there are a lot of similarities between students experiencing homelessness as well as those that are in foster care. About one third of homeless youth have had prior experiences also in the foster care system. And so it's important that when we're working with these students, we're coming from a trauma-informed approach and provi providing holistic wraparound services and not just assisting with the housing piece and providing those basic needs. And at times when we think about homelessness, we might still think about that image of someone sleeping on a park bench, um, but really homelessness can look really different. It can be a lot of different things. It can be staying in a car. It could be couch surfing and staying with friends. It also could be those students that might have a room in a residence hall, but otherwise they might not have a place to go during the breaks or during campus closures. And there are many different missions of homelessness. But when we talk about homelessness, we are typically using the McKinney-Vento definition, which is an individual who lacks a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. And this definition is a little bit more broad and more general than the HUD definition. And here we also have the definition of an unaccompanied homeless youth. So someone who is under the age of 24 and fits the definition above, but is not in the physical um, custody of a parent or guardian. And so this year, the HOPE Center released a report which found that approximately 16% of university students and 17% of two-year respondents replied that they were homeless within the last year. And we're seeing even some higher rates. So for example, the California Community College System reported about 19% of homelessness in their system. And some institutions and colleges have created their own basic needs assessment services to assess their own individual's campus distinct needs and population. And so we just wanted to note there are some really distinct challenges for students experiencing homelessness under the age of 24 and those that are older. Youth might have specific barriers accessing financial aid or transitioning from high school where they might have had a support system where they're making event to liaison for four years. Older students might have their own set of uh, barriers, such as they might not be eligible or they might have aged out of specific programs on campus. They might not have housing options that allow for their partner or for their children to join them on campus. And also, these students might have tried college before but are now returning back to school, and they might have some holds on their financial aid, um, whether it's SAP or for other reasons. And so it's really important to keep in mind these age distinctions when working with this population. And this next slide goes over what young people have mentioned that they need to be successful in school. This was taken from a study in California from the California Homeless Youth Project that interviewed students across the state. They found that having a connection to a supportive adult, so whether that be a homeless higher education liaison or a basic needs staff member, or maybe someone you here that's joining us in the webinar, um, that is super helpful. Being able to access basic needs to have that stability, navigating the financial aid process, and just knowing that existing services and campus support programs and resources exist. And so we have actually compiled some of the best practices and resources that we've seen that are tackling these issues and created a series of tip sheets for helping homeless youth succeed. And that's listed at the bottom of the resource slide at the end of this presentation that we'll go over. And so I just wanted to provide some context about college homelessness before we hear the amazing services and support that's happening at Kennesaw State. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Marcy to introduce herself. Hi, this is Marcy Stidham. Um, I'm the director of Kennesaw State University. Um, I'm very honored to be able to present to you all about our services and what different things we offer our students at Kennesaw State. Um, I just want to go ahead and say that we have this presentation set up where I'm giving information, I'm giving you feed, giving you ideas that we have um, 
tried and are actively doing on our campus, um, but um, but we have it set up where you can definitely jump in with questions, either through the chat box or we have um, designated break times where you can ask questions. So please ask questions. Um, we are prepared to answer as much as we can during the time allotted. Um, so what I wanted to first share was, um, this is a snapshot of our webpage, um, Care Services Umbrella Program. Did not start out that way, but it has developed that way since 2013. Um, and so we're gonna talk about two of our primary programs, but we do have what we call KSU Cares, which is the main program we're gonna talk about today for our homeless foster care, food and secure students on our campus. We're going to also highlight our financial hardships or emergency assistance program, but we also utilize um, our KSU, we have a KSU VISTA network and um, a statewide program for homeless and foster care kids in Georgia that are in high school called Gear Up Georgia. Um, and I'm going to kind of touch base on how you can use a VISTA if you have VISTA programs in your area and or in your campus to support your work. Um, it's, it's been a vital resource for us for the past two years. Um, okay. So KSU Cares um, is, as I mentioned, our program that is dedicated to homeless, foster care, food insecure students on our campus. Um, this is the program that started everything for care. Um, this was a program that I, when I started it in 2013, well, 2011, officially 2013, um, that it was not in planned, um, and I think that is something where when I talk to other colleges and universities across the state and the country, um, it's helpful to hear that, you know, you can, it doesn't have to be planned. You can come up with some ideas um, and be able to address the situation, but we have been at this for a while and have grown it to um, the four programs you see, but right now in front of you, the six tenets of our program. The Pantry, Case Management, Temporary Housing, our SIN program, Temporary Work and Scholarships. So as most people on campuses start out, they start out with a pantry. Um, our pantry has been around since 20, 2006. Um, I inherited the pantry in 2014. It is, we have a multi-campus um, environment, so we have two campuses, well, three campuses, and we have pantries on two of the three. Um, the two, both of our campus pantries are shopping style pantries, but we started out just like most people. Um, the pantry for a long time was a drawer in my office um, that grew to a closet, that grew to two closets, and now are two um, mini grocery stores. Um, what we do in those pantries, they serve all our KSU students. And as we talk about how we've responded during COVID, I'm going to really highlight how we continue to serve all our KSU students through our campus pantries, even though all of us are working um, remotely from our home um, and there are not as many students still on campus. Um, but we still have about 300 students who are still on campus, and these are students who our campus has identified who um, cannot go home, and so we're still providing support. And of those 300, there are several students here who are what we would call care students because they have been identified as they can't go anywhere because they're homeless, um, their foster care situation, um, or, or and they're homeless maybe because of domestic violence or family violence. So our case management program is, a, I am a social worker by training. Um, so this is a service that we did together, campus pantries and the case management program. But I will say our case management program is only for students who identify themselves as homeless, foster care, food insecure. So the pantry serves all, is available to all 38,000 of our students. While case management, we serve about a boutique number of around 150 to 200 students directly uh, through a case management approach. We utilize interns, um, and so we have a cadre of interns who have meetings with these students based on their needs. Some students get to see a couple times a week or have conversations a couple times a week. Some students, like our seniors who are getting ready to graduate, um, we see them maybe once a month. We have temporary housing. That is exactly what it sounds like, but it's within our campus um, apartments or dormitories. And what we do is we basically run a 
kind of like a bed and breakfast. We rotate students in and out. We do have two students right now in our temporary housing um, because they uh, are completely definition by the definition of a, actually HUD um, homeless. So right now they are staying in our temporary housing program. Our SIN program, that's our um, newest program for our students who we recruit to the university from high school who are homeless or foster care in high school. And so this is a um, even more in-depth version of our case management where these students get specialized services. They go through a summer bridge and we do um, different things for them. We're even working on right now having our own dedicated housing unit just for those students. Our temporary work program is a partnership with Federal Work Study. Um, where we can place a student on campus in a temporary work site. Um, and it's great for our, especially for our foster care youth who need opportunities to have a, some job experience and get extra cash in their pocket. And then we have several scholarships. I think we have about eight to nine scholarships right now. Um, and we've been, this last year, we've been able to give a full ride scholarship um, and um, from a donor who wanted to do that special gift to a student this year. Um, so we hope to be able to continue to do that full ride scholarship, but no matter what, we do have eight or nine standing scholarships. What I will say is over the time, we have served a lot of students through these different programs. And so what we've learned is these six programs have been able to help us address the students from admission to graduation and provide the support that we need to. Um, the only other thing that we're working on even more on is our alumni association because we have so many students who are graduating. We have about six that are graduating this semester that we're supporting and helping to make sure that they find housing once they graduate, because most of them live on campus, as well as hope they can get connected to a job, okay? So just like I said, I wanted to highlight real quickly our financial um, hardships program. Um, this is just a flow chart to just tell you this is how we make the process. It is a collaboration between Dean of Students, Care Services, and Financial Aid and scholarships that our school is within Financial Aid. This is a way where we are, this is, has been fantastic right now in the moment we're in to um, manage requests for rental assistance. So we're seeing an uptick this month for rental assistance requests. And that's mainly because students, it's about middle of the month, um, students are starting to get their bills for May um, and trying to figure out what their next steps are. Um, just talked to a young lady this week who has been let go of her job because of COVID-19 and she um, is not sure how she's going to pay her different rent. So we're already, I applauded her for being proactive, getting to us early, and we're going to see what resources we have through financial aid dollars. So that means they're going to relook at her um, FAFSA, see if she has utilized all the funding or awards that are allotted to her, which does include loans, but see if she also qualifies for any other things. There are ungifted scholarships sometimes, and maybe we have found students who've been able to make a match that way. Um, at the end of the day, if they don't, if there's not anything financial aid or scholarships can do, they default back to my team. Um, we have um, our program coordinator and our student assistant looks at each one and then we take on again that case management model and work with each student. We have been able to award, we've only been doing this program um, since August of 2019, but we've been able to give out well over $15,000 to students in support and help to help them. And then we're also actively fundraising to help students um, through this in partnership with our KSU Foundation. Okay. So how do we make it happen? Um, so we function like a nonprofit. We um, do have state budget. Um, we have, um, as we have listed, that the primary team is myself, but I'm split between all four programs that I oversee. Our program coordinator who is dedicated to our CARES, KSU CARES program, and we have a student assistant dedicated to our KSU CARES program. Um, so our salaries are state funded, and we have a small operational budget, which is state funded. But beyond that, all the resources, like right now you're looking at a picture of one of our temporary apartments that we had decorated so that way when students come in, they feel home. Um, we make sure we get their bed and their linen is their gift. 
So every time a student moves in, they get uh, fresh sheets, fresh pillows, um, fresh towels, um, and we stock the room full of food. And that's our gift to them. When they move out, they can take all the towels, sheets, pillows, and linens with them. And, you know, in, the, you know, in theory, to their next apartment, which I will say 99% of the time that does happen. Um, so we do a lot of fundraising. Um, this week I've been working with our KSU Foundation on doing, seeking a lot of um, grants. Um, as you saw, Gear Up Georgia, that's a federal DOE grant, but most of the grants that I use for the KSU Care Program are foundation grants. So we're looking at different companies and their foundations. I was doing that just last night. Um, but also, um, a lot of individual gifts. And so we work, I work closely with our foundation department. Um, and we come up with strategies of how to engage our donors. I have an advisory board made up of um, community members, um, some of them trustee wise and different things of that nature who have been very supportive. So that's how we have that campus culture of caring. It's everybody's involved from faculty, staff to students, but also our trustees and our foundation are involved to um, support these efforts. Um, it's not, I would say it's it would be impossible to do everything we're doing without that level of support. Um, most of our donations, like I said, via the foundation, tangible and monetary, we have a system now where we're tracking every can of food that comes in and um, turning that into the foundation so that counts towards a, um, so they can get a tax deduction letter for that as well, just like with their monetary donations. So we come up with a dollar amount, well, the, the donor comes up with a dollar amount, fill out the form, and then they get the letter they need for taxes. So everything we do um, is tax deductible, but all the donations directly benefit our students. Um, so like I said, we utilize a lot of interns. So that's master of social work interns, global communications interns, marketing interns, health and human services interns. Just talked to the director of our public health program, gonna bring those interns in. So always trying to figure out how I can utilize resources on campus that always exist, not recreate the will. There are students who need internships. There are federal work study students who can, who all our federal work study students, we have five uh, federal work study students and they manage our pantries. Um, we have one, like I said, one student assistant, but if for some reason the budget was cut and we couldn't have that position, we would just ask to have be considered for a federal work study position. So we work very closely with federal work study. So I'm constantly trying to find ways to utilize free, already existing resources and co collaborations and partnerships to make sure um, the programs can run efficiently and effectively. Um, one way is with the VISTA program. So our VISTA program now is for the campus-wide. We have um, 15 summer associates coming in, which are undergrad students, but then we have um, nine full-time positions that work for a year at a time, 40 hours a week, um, and they all have to be bachelor, have their bachelor's, so we recruit from our grad school. Um, so with those, out of those nine full-time VISTAs, three of them are dedicated to the CARES Who CARES program. Um, the other ones are sprinkled throughout the university. But the inspiration to start this program was, honestly, we needed help. Um, and so got into this, seeing it as an opportunity to benefit the campus, but also benefit the program. So we have um, a program assistant who helps um, with our ASCEND program and some of the program management, the day-to-day -day operations um, that the, our program coordinator needs assistance with. Um, also, we have um, brought in a person to help us with um, our assessment and data management strategies, as well as we have someone to help us with our marketing and outreach. Um, we utilize a lot of ways to communicate with our students, um, and so to do that, you almost need somebody sitting on um, social media and your websites and keeping your websites fresh and up to date as much as we can. But I still have marketing interns. So my, I have a, an outreach team. It's the Vista as well as a marketing intern. And so they keep my websites looking great, um, pump out all the different information that needs to be pumped out from a social media platform. They're amazing. 
And then campus partnerships. Um, one example I want to highlight was auxiliary services. So for our campus, that's um, auxiliary services or campus services is the group who oversees dining, housing, bookstore. Um, I don't see everything. Uh, eateries, different things of that nature. So, and also like central receiving and distribution. So, our partnership with them, we actually meet with them monthly, and over time, we have come up with issues, ways to resolve how payment process. So, when we use a donation, if we want to pay for rental assistance, we have a streamlined process. Um, like I said, we're looking to hopefully by the, um, next year have dedicated uh, dedicated house for our SIN program. That's because we are going to be a part of their learning living community. And so that's a conversation that we had with them. Um, our overflow for our pantry where we don't have enough space for inventory. Um, we have partnered with Central Receiving Distribution um, and doing things that way. We're partnering on um, different initiatives where they have worked with different community partners and they want to bring us in and we're collaborating together to make their partnership with that community um, donor stronger, um, but also to make our services broader and build up our capacity to serve for our students. Um, we're, we're looking at food stamps and so we're in the process, we're about 30 days away from bringing in, you know, being able to help students apply for food stamps on campus. Um, so the bookstore said, well, let's see, can we take food stamps? So they're working on that. So all these different things are because of one partnership. That didn't highlight the partnerships I have with admissions for recruitment or financial aid or um, the registrar's office or the bursar's office. It, the, the, the key is having strategic partnerships throughout the campus to be able to pull those different things together. And I've even seen some campuses where maybe you don't have a one point stop like we do at ASU. Um, then pull a committee together of all those different partners and let's just put all ideas on the table and see what we come up with. It becomes really cool and um, awesome. Uh, one thing I will say, um, we still have our ongoing staffing and space issue. You know, if you provide it, they come. So we, in our pantry, serve, um, um, we're averaging 600 individual unique um, shoppers a year. So they average about 2.8 um, visits each. So that's 18,000 shops. Uh, shopping visits in a year. That's a lot of people. <laughs> um, so we're running out of space. Uh, and we have pretty decent space. Um, so we've been working again um, with our campus partners and so we're working toward um, once we get back on the campus to increase the space, we've been approved. But, you know, but then there's also the staffing. So that's why I'm constantly looking at this does that uh, interns, but it is hard to manage where interns change, you know, some year to year, some semester to semester. Um, this has changed year to year. Um, so it, it, is a, it is a difficult beast to manage, um, but I'm always happy to manage it because at least we have people who can help us because we've utilized the different resources at our, at our fingertips to be able to help and support people, okay? Um, so identify then assess. So these are ways that we've identified our students. A lot of times people ask, how do you identify, how do you find them? Some people have had pantries that, um, you know, sometimes they're hidden on campus or they may be, stand, you know, stand out, but they don't have a lot of students coming. My first thing is marketing and PR. Um, our first donor, large donor, came from um, the PR um, where we were in the newspaper, um, the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Um, we've done different articles on campus, just did one this week with the student newspaper. Um, they always know if they have any questions of me that I'm happy to answer them. Um, so, and then again, you know, um, jumping down to one of my other bullets, social media, just being able to get that visual presence out there. Um, we're on, you know, of course, we're on Facebook. I always remind my students, because they always say, why do we need to be on Facebook? And I'll say, Facebook is for the people who donate. Um, and, and I'll say, so people my age are on Facebook and people my age and older than me donate. Um, and so that's how we make sure that they know what's going on, but also a lot of faculty and staff are on there. And so um, that's a great way to communicate them um, with them. We do Instagram, Reddit, Wildfire, 
Um, we're constantly trying to keep up with what the students are on. So we've recently added Reddit and Wildfire. We don't post posts on Reddit and Wildfire. We um, monitor it. And then if there's questions, because um, one of the, they did a, a survey of students during this time we're in right now. And the number three question from all our students is care still open? And so we're monitoring all the different things because what we're seeing is on those different areas. Somebody may say something and we may, you know, um, Tiffany, my VISTA, may jump in and say, hey, here's the right information. No, yes, we're open. Yes, we're still giving out food. Here's the process. You know, just making sure that people get the right information. We also partner with our parent family association because they have a um, online system that they, a newsletter that they send out. So they're always, we're always communicating with them um, and tagging and sharing information as best we can. Classroom presentations. Um, that's really helpful. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've done classroom presentations. And once I left, a student will walk up to me and say, okay, so I'm homeless. And so we stand over in the corner, have a conversation, and we get that student in service quickly. Because one thing I will say, if anybody knows me, um, my heart burns. If, I, if I'm, I'm providing a service to help you, and I want you to get help. And, and if, if there's a student out there not getting help, I can't handle it. Um, I want to make sure that those students get the services they need. Um, high impact experiences. So this goes off, you know, people are talking a lot about HIPs and with high impact practices. So high impact experiences are just basically outreach. Um, we do a, this will be our November of this year, we have 13th annual homelessness awareness week. Um, that's about, oh goodness, 13 to 15 events in one week that are high impact opportunities for students to volunteer. Um, we're bringing on uh, local companies and business and corporations who want to do large scale volunteer opportunities. Um, we don't just do a volunteer to do volunteer. Um, some of our volunteer opportunities are with our um, uh, vigil. So we do the county, we host the county vigil to honor all people in the county who, who died um, in the past year from um, being homeless. So it takes a lot of people to bring all those community members on. We bless in or shuttle in um, local shelter residents because we want them to say goodbye to their person. We do it as a non-denominational um, homegoing service and honoring their lives. We also do a mop soup kitchen afterwards so we can feed the shelter residents. Because a lot of times us bringing them on campus interfere, interferes with their shelter dinner time. Um, so that's the experience, I mean, because a lot of students walk away and go, wow, you know, they're just like me. Um, you can't trade that to sit down with somebody who has a bachelor's and who's homeless at the local shelter, and you're sitting there working on your, you know, and they're, and they're just like, they're just like me. So it's pretty impactful. Um, and then we do partnerships with the football team to make sure we do a food drive, and then um, bring in different donations that week to restock the pantry. Um, also, um, we partner with uh, uh, do another with another university um, from Florida and partner with them so that they can come on campus and do this exchange. Where, and we make sure that they have an experience. And so this year, um, the university that we that was in the exchange went to one of the local shelters and stayed in the shelter for the week and had that immersion experience. Um, online scheduling, this is something we've been doing for the past two and a half years. This has helped our numbers because students um, most often reach out after midnight. And so this way they can schedule an appointment at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, and if we have availability ne that next day, then they will see them, you know, later that, if they did it at 2 a.m., we'll see them later that day at 3 p.m. Um, I make sure we have info cards spread all over campus where people can pass out the information. Um, again, campus partnerships. And then admissions and orientation, just partnering with them on those incoming students. Whether you know it or not, I know we all cannot access the FAFSA and see the information that's on there, but um, we, and I have a question that we use at it on, for our universal application, and we're trying, and more and more universities in Georgia are adding it, so it's really cool. Um, that that work is helping other universities in our state, and we're using that question. Um, and Schoolhouse Connections, I've shared that question with them a couple of times, but we've used that question, and um, it's helping us to see how many people are applying to come to Kennesaw State. 
um, who are homeless and or foster care, and what that does is then we are doing direct recruitment to them, and so those students are getting into our SIN program, so this year we're seeing all that hard work come together. Um, because it's better to catch them at the point of admission, because there are a lot of hurdles that they're going to go through. Those are things, that's why we have the summer bridge. Um, so that way we can work through the different challenges that they're going to face um, that's unique to these populations. And um, so that way when they start school, they can just, you know, be a student. Um, if there's an honor in just being able to be a student and not having to worry about um, every small minutia detail and having somebody to share that burden. Um, so it's been really awesome to work with admissions and orientation on our recruitment strategy and seeing, you know, all these students. I was looking at a couple of emails today um, in our uh, peer services at Kennesaw.edu email and just really excited about all the kids who are excited to be Ascend Scholars. So it's just, it was just wonderful, okay? So questions or questions? Any questions? Yeah, we have one question so far. So if folks have a question, feel free to ask it and we'll get it to it right after this first one. But this question is, since you all are a university and have on-campus housing by default under quote, normal circumstances, why would there be a need for students to live in temporary housing or in a hotel? Why couldn't these students just live in the dorm or traditional on-campus housing? Okay, great question. So um, one is, especially in the fall semester, our, our campus is always 100% full. I think we started off fall 2019 with the wait list of, oh, I'm gonna say it was somewhere close to like in the thousands. Um, so we we don't have empty, um, beds when we start our campus. We don't, and we have, and housing is only 10, 12 years old on our campus, so we only have about um, four, uh, four to 5,000 beds um, and for 38,000 school population, so we're kind of out of sync there. So um, what I will say is, so that's the reason why um, we use hotels and temporary housing, especially in the fall semester, because we don't, we don't have any other options. Uh, but we do work with campus housing, and so our average, if you take out two or three, we have two or three outliers, um, but if you take those out, our average bed days are about um, 21, 22 days. Um, so in that time frame, we help students um, find um, community. We have, we're surrounded by like six or seven um, community, um, private style student housing, um, often they're full. Um, and then also, um, what we do is work with our campus housing and, and see once that wait list starts to whittle down, can, you know, can we get in where there's opportunities where somebody just didn't show or something like that or pulled out of their contract at the last second. Um, also, our campus is not, our campus is about, is, is about 55, 50, year, 55 years old. So I say that to say we, um, in Georgia, um, we follow um, the, PPP, which is um, public-private partnership. Um, so our housing is not university housing. It's, our, it's owned through our foundation. So it's apartment style. So they have to pay monthly rent on our campus. And a lot of universities are um, going to this model. A lot of older universities may still have more of a room and board style. We don't. So housing is not mandatory. It is optional, even for freshmen. So with that said, they have to pay monthly rent. Our average rent is around $700 a month, all inclusive plus Wi-Fi, um, which is cheaper than the private style housing. So, and then that leads me into my third part. We are the third, we are in the third most expensive county in the state of Georgia. Um, we might be getting close to the second most. Um, so because of that, um, most of the rent is very high. And so most of the students that I work with who are homeless, don't have jobs, um, and if their FAFSA is still messed up, they might not be getting a refund. Um, that's one reason why you need temporary housing. Or if they did get a refund, they really need to be able to pay like four or five hundred dollars a month. Um, that's not happening. So we have to give them time to, um, 
usually they have an off-campus job. So we put them in our apartment, we work with them to get them a temp, um, an on-campus job. So most of our students have two to three jobs. Um, the third job is typically an online job. So an online job, on-campus job, and you maybe work down the street in Wendy's or something. Um, and so that's how they start to piece it together to be able to afford that. So I hope that gives you an example of why. But I do know universities, like there's one in South Carolina, um, she's doing a great job. And so they didn't have 100% full housing. And so, yeah, she got rid of housing. So, and so I would encourage anybody to do that. If you don't have 100% full housing, it becomes an opportunity to be a part of, um, to see if you can, like we're doing, become a learning community, or say, hey, you're not using this housing. And it's better to get half rent than no rent, or at least maybe say you have occupancy and not get rent, but you at least say you have occupancy. And there's value in people being in those houses and not being just sitting there. So I hope that helps. We got another question. How do you all assess needs? Is it an interview and a needs assessment? Yeah, um, a couple of ways. Um, so we did um, participate in the Hope Center's um, campus um, need, needs assessment, and that was so helpful. Um, I was greatly appreciative of that data and that information. Um, also, we do um, we do, do in-person interviews, and I'll talk about how we're going to shift that now that we've learned from our, what we've learned with this. Um, so we do, um, they go online and they do a quick screener, um, because, and the screener is set up, I have it set up where more people get an appointment than the more people we screen out. And the reason why it screens out people, sometimes people say, I'm not homeless, I just need, um, I heard y'all got a place where I can stay. Um, or I have somebody say, um, I don't like my room, so I, I heard y'all had a nice room. I mean, so it's, you know, when people want to abuse the system, that happens. Um, but we do a quick screener, and it's basically, and it's, it's a part of our data and our assessment um, metrics. But once we get them in, um, they meet with one of our MSW interns, um, and they talk about what's going on. I developed the assessment years ago. We've tweaked it uh, over time, but it's to get all the information because we're trying to see, do they have children? Well, if they do, that means they qualify for different services and supports. Um, do they, um, you know, do they already get governmental assistance, or we ask questions so we know what government assistance do they qualify for? So it is a... Um, an assessment to get information. I will say, you know, students can come to our pantry and never have to answer hardly any questions. We just have, like, what's your name? Are you a student? Um, do you give us permission to give you food, basically? It takes about five seconds for the pantry. So students don't have to meet with our case managers to access the pantry, but then once they want more in-depth services or to get in, um, to, you know, utilize um, dollars that we have to um, pay for rental assistance, um, through the KSU CARES program, um, then yes, we do do that in-person interview. And I would say for our financial assistance um, program, um, our financial hardship application is all online, um, and it's very cursory just to give us enough information. So, But if that person qualifies for care, we'll, we'll get them over into our care program because of their homelessness or foster care status. Um, but if they don't, um, then we'll just assess them based on what information we got virtually. and um, you know, call it and, and give them, you know, if there's any paperwork to be done because of financial aid or whatever, we'll do that. But giving them an award that way directly to the bursar's office. Great. And before we continue on to the rest of your PowerPoint, Marcy, um, would you be willing to share a copy of the assessment with folks on the webinar? Which one? The oh, the um, the assessment we do in case management. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you. Know, uh, that one I would ask people to email me, and I think my email um, is at the end. Yes. All right. So folks that are asking for a copy, uh, feel free to email Marcy, and she'll send it to you. And so we have a few more questions coming in, but we have a, uh, a few more slides that we'll go through first before we get to them. I'll turn it to you, Marcy. Okay. So um, you can go ahead and click to the next one, Julie. <laughs> So when all this started on March 13th, well, for us, it started on like the, the 12th and, you know, just to feel the, all the shift of everything and trying to prepare and like we were having kind of, I was huddling up with Carrie who um, is on the call and helping to, 
you know, answer quick questions if she can. And, um, you know, so uh, we started huddling up and kind of trying to figure out, okay, what are we doing? What are we doing? So, and then on the 13th, we had 59 people shop in one day. Um, so they depleted the pantry. Um, we had we were already getting low, trying to get more donations in, needing to go to the Atlanta Community Food Bank and shop. And then this happened, and so kind of got caught, and it cleaned us out. Um, so we came up with a plan um, that we thought was like, okay, this is a really good plan. And that's why it's called week one, because that's how long it lasted, one week, because um, we kept shifting our plan. So, um, and then we had a student who ended up being homeless on the 13th. Uh, Carrie got him, Carrie got him moved into the apartment complex. We are strongly based on interns. So we started feeling like getting the message, like they're going to pull the interns because they're going to just end everything. So it was, uh, I kept saying my house of cards are falling, my house of cards is falling. Um, and so I think we worked that whole weekend. Um, just trying to respond and attend to different things. So I gave you an infographic here of like what we thought. I mean, like when we did this, we thought this was a great plan. Um, and it may still work for some folks and everything. So we wanted to make sure people knew where we were because we thought at that time we could stay on campus. We were like, well, um, we'll just figure out the CDC rules and come up with a modified pantry schedule. So um, we closed our Marietta campus pantry um, and got food by food bags taken to the housing hub. So our housing is divided up into three hubs. So north, south on Kennesaw campus, and then Marietta campus. So we got food bags to the housing hub and told the housing folks, you know, to start texting them and saying, hey, if you need have students need food, um, use the use the bags in the hub or let us know and we'll get food to you, especially on Marietta campus. But we were like, but they can ride um, the bob because that's our campus bus, Big Owl, we're the owls, so Big Owl, Big Owl bus. So we was like, but they can ride the bob over because um, the federal work study students can't work. So those who manage our pantry stuff, but we're, we've got this, we've got this. Um, so you'll see we came up with the hours, um, came up with a whole plan. Um, one thing I will say that stayed um, standard was um, our case management. So that was real easy for us. Um, our case management documentation system is through um, our university advising system. Um, we're not advisors, but we can utilize the system. Again, it was a free resource and it was cheaper to just be a part of the advising system. So we had been in that system for about two years. And so we already had the capability to put our notes virtually. And then our department had, because of my program coordinator, Carrie, like I said, she came up with this great idea where, hey, everybody, you know, at first she was a resistant to Microsoft Teams, but then she became the Microsoft Teams and the four stack cheerleader. And um, so we, we picked at her, but now we're thankful for her. Um, so um, between form stack to put some things online, um, so people can upload and click and sign and do all the cool things they can do in FormStack with documents. Um, for us to continue to use the EAB um, Navigate system to put our notes in and schedule appointments, because that's our scheduler. Um, but then we just jumped into Microsoft Teams. It's, um, we learned from our IT department. Um, we knew it was FERPA compliant, which hits us, but it's also HIPAA compliant, which makes me as a social worker who used to manage mental health facilities, um, county mental health facilities for 10 years. Um, that made me feel really good about it. So we easily flipped for our case management into an online system. So we just, we and but one thing I love that we did, and it was a small decision at the time, but we found out how big and important it was. Um, our interns, before we lost most of them, um, all sat down and called every single case management student. Called every single case management student and said, we're here, what do you need? Don't drop your classes, because <laughs> you paid for them. Um, talk to us first, but let us know if you need anything. Um, and every case management student was so thankful. Some of them was like, I don't need you, but it's so nice to know somebody's here. 
Um, we also emailed, because it's 600 of them, but we emailed every um, case um, pantry student and let them know this is what we're doing. This, and we thought that was a good. We thought that was going to be the plan, but we were like, "This is what we're doing, and this is what we're doing." And here's, and you still can get food. Um, and here's the link to go online, and um, you know, let us know you want to get food, or you can just come by. At this point, we kept saying, "You just come by," because um, you can just do the walk-in for the pantry. Um, but if somebody needs to pre-order their food, we had a form for that. So we can't, that work week one plan made us feel good for that first week. Um, because we we felt like we got something, and then also what I did is what you know my role is now. Carrie was doing all the boots on the ground stuff, talking to the students, talking to the case management students, taking care of that, taking care of our student workers, um, attending to them because most of our student workers, including interns, are low income students themselves. Um, what I did is I shifted and focused on the donors. And I started talking to them through email and newsletters, talked to my board members, ended up talking on the phone with trustees, just started talking to people and, it, and people would call, call, call. And I would talk to all those donors and just say, this is what we need. And at that time I was like, send me food. Got to my churches that I work with um, in our community um, and got, Donations after donations after donations. So for the pantry, by that next, so on Friday the 13th, depleted. By the following Wednesday, stuffed. It was so packed out. We we had, you know, but that's what, that's what, you know, my role has become in a lot of ways, is to make sure that my team, I always tell my team, my job is to take care of you so you can take care of all this stuff that I created. Um, and so that's what we've been doing. So that was our week one plan. Sounds like a great plan. Well, then the next week, um, we go to week two. That's when they closed down the offices and closed all the buildings. And well, they didn't, they closed, they kept a couple of buildings, um, but the buildings that they closed were all the buildings I was in. So, so then I had, a, I had, a, I realized, oh, I forgot to give somebody external door access and different things like that. So I started juggling. Um, so again, we kept that case management model that stayed. Pantry on that Thursday after the 13th, we told everybody come in. We um, I, I looked up all the CDC stuff and came up with a statement. And luckily, my daughter for high school sent us all this stuff, you know, through um, the Remind app. And I was like, oh, that's a good statement. So I said, hey, post this on everybody's walls about, you know, six feet of space. At that point, didn't you know, social distancing wasn't you know, common words to say, and we posted everything. I brought mask in on that Thursday, and I was like, put mask on, and we told everybody, come in, stand six to ten feet apart from each other in the hallway, and we told people, and then we kept the hallways, in, you know, only with so many people, and kept, the, and anybody else was coming in, we said, you have to stand outside, but keep keep six to ten feet away from each other. Um, so that day we had students come in and shop. Um, then that night I went home, um, cried, because I was trying to figure out what to do. Um, but then had kind of like a, 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 a clarity, a moment of clarity, talked to someone who I asked for um, advice from and said, okay, this is what I'm thinking, help me think it through. And we realized, you know, police department. So this is the we so we have a community engagement officer in our campus police. We partner with the campus police. And like this is our week two model, and it's still our model. This is our COVID model. Um, so we continued with the pantry order form. Carrie went into Formstack, changed it around, um, and basically, students now kind of like Uber Eats or Grubhub or whatever is your pick, DoorDash um, order their food. Now at this now we've gotten it where we, we did have a whole food order where you could pick the food you want. Um when we thought we could still be there. But we were um blessed to have a ton of um food box donations and so we left them like that. Usually we tear them apart so people can shop. We kept them as boxes. Carrie made that call. And um now people can request a food box. And so what happens is what we're doing now um is you put in a food order. Carrie, and we still have a student assistant working. We have one intern out of our five. Um, 
and but our student assistant when I got it set up where she could work virtually. Um, so Carrie and Devin are constantly responding to emails to our care services at Kennesaw.edu email. Um, and so when some and so the form stack pops a automatic message into our email, they respond, give students a pickup time. And what we worked out with CJ, who, like I said, is the KSU Campus Police Engagement Officer. Um, CJ then tells dispatch on our Kennesaw campus, hey, such and such come pick up food. We have food box, those food boxes have now been taken to the KSU dispatch office. And when a student comes, they check in at the window, stay behind the window in the lobby, and food is placed out in the in the um in the lobby in that box at a safe social distance. They close the door and the student takes the food and goes home. Um largely that's worked. We've had one student who couldn't the box is heavy, so the student couldn't carry um the box, but um they worked with her and they I think some you know, one of the police officers was able to help that student get it home. But largely it has worked really well. Our married a campus students um still have food bags in that hub. That way if students can't get to the campus, the Kennesaw campus, they're 10 miles apart. Um, but if that student can't get to the campus, um, then what we do is we um they can get food from Emma, who's the hub director um, for the Marietta campus. Um, so we re we really have figured it out. Um, Josh, we still have one intern. Um, he is still seeing case management clients um, virtually. Carrie is seeing case management clients. But we felt comfortable enough where we're actually actually setting up special appointments just with our graduates, so we can start having conversations with them. Okay, everybody can't find a job right now. What are we doing for housing? What resources do we need to look at? So I'm already helping, we're already helping to figure out with donors and partners to figure out what's happening. So that's how we've responded. Um, you know, I think, again, the key is um, case management. Um, how you do a virtual pantry is through gift cards. Um, we've got people to donate us gift cards. Also, we've used in our donation funds to, um, pass out gift cards virtually, so purchase gift cards so we can pass those out. Um, so that's another way that we've, we're we utilizing that because we have see some people who have special dietary restrictions. Um, we have a lot of international students who are, who are still on campus. And so we're helping those students to um, um, with gift cards um, so they can get extra food because they might not have meal swipes because meal swipes is not required um, for everybody or or they may not have enough meal swipes. So we use gift, cat, gift cards, food boxes, um, trying to make sure students utilize the different things with um, food delivery systems so that way they don't have to be out because we're in a shelter in place in Georgia. Um, but the, the real big blessing was the community pantries who brought those um, large growth of um, food boxes for us so we could be able to use that with the um, campus police. So any questions? All right, we got a few. Um, so someone asked, our university has many of these resources that you've shared previously, but they're not all housed under one roof. They are also a multi-campus institution as well. Do you have any recommendations on where to get started to bring all these together under one roof? Yeah, um, you know, Find like-minded people who want to um, partner. Um, and one example of is with tuition waiver. They were under fiscal services, and then scholarship was under foundation, and um, financial aid was financial aid. So now, and then there was a registrar. At one point, when I started all this, all four of those were different departments. Um, now. Scholarship is under financial aid, tuition and waivers on the registrar. So it makes it easier. But what happened was I started just doing, there's nothing wrong with a, um, a blind email. I just email people and just say, could we have a conversation? Is a possible way we could set up a meeting? And so I'll never forget in the beginning, there was a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings just with different people. And then just slowly over time, thank goodness all those people are still, a lot of those people are still at the university. Um, but just having a lot of conversations about different people. Auxiliary services, that was, um, we're gonna be doing those meetings now. We're not going into our second year. 
Um, but before, yes, I was having a lot of hard times getting to a bookstore, getting to, but it just so happened the director of campus services um, was, a part, was a partner or a friend, got promoted into that director position, and, and so, you know, so the relationship continued. Um, if, um, dependent on, you know, if you're within the Department of Student Affairs, you know, seeing if there's a relationship, if there are relationships, you can start just in that, within the Student Affairs Office. Um, I will say um, admissions, if you get with a person who's in charge of recruitment, um, they have a natural, I always look for, how can I help you do your job? Um, so they have a natural inclination to want to recruit people and so and figure out how to recruit people and what strategies they can build up. So I would say admissions is more excited about us than we are about them some days because this helps them do their job and increases their performance. And all day, any day, these are usually first generation students we're talking about. And so that's something where the re research is there. Um, research is still growing on homelessness and, and, you know, in this population, but research is there on first generation too. So a lot of people want to have those first gen conversations. So see if there's already a first gen group or team that you can be a part of and see can you bring in more partners that way who may want to help you get more of the first gen word out with a special focus on low income, especially homeless students. I hope that helps. Awesome. And then uh, just Housing offer homeless and foster students priority housing? Nope, not at all. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, there's, there's, they have to do their own dance, and I always look for win-win solutions, but I, I don't, we make sure our students follow their rules, and, we, and I'm not asking them to, to bend or break their own. Um, so, no, we do not get priority housing, um, but because of that relationship, um, and they know, you know, they let us, they let us, they let us know where where our students are on the waiting list. I mean, I've had students number three hundred and fifty five on waiting list, um, and but then also say, so that's the waiting list. So what what other things? So we have found out that you know there's the waiting list for upperclassmen, there's a waiting list for underclassmen, there's a waiting list for, you know, Marietta campus may have a less of a waiting list. So I'll go back to a student and say, look. Um, you're un you're you're a freshman, so you're it's going to be hard. But when you go to Marietta campus, um, they have less of a waiting list over there, and so students shift and be willing to go over there. But no, we do not get um, preferential treatment when I do rental assistance. Um, I pay the same rent as the other students. Our temporary housing, um, thankfully, we have two donors that pay for each, but we pay the full amount. Um, of rent for a whole year each year and we've just been uh, again blessed to have donors to um, be able to do that for us but I will say um, at campuses the campus I highlighted in South Carolina um, the housing they have I think she because it was empty they were able to finagle um, a much better situation and then I'm in the process of doing the same with um, the learning living community um, being able to pick a house that um, is cheaper monthly rent, um, but then be able to leverage that to talk to potential um, donors and um, university friends to say, um, hey, their rent each month is, you know, this one's actually going to be like five, five fifty. So I'm so excited. That's very cheap for um, Cobb County in general. Um, but you know, you know, can we get enough donations to help offset that by maybe $150, $200? Okay, and so I'll let you get to your next step slide before we get back to some more Q&A. Okay. So next step. So these are the three things so far that we have learned that we're going to continue. Um, one thing our vice president um, said recently at our, um, for our Division of Student Affairs, um, he had a, a, a team meeting with all the directors as well as the whole entire staff the past two weeks. And um, one thing he said is we're learning so much, we're, we can't go back. We've learned too much. And that's true. So case management, we will continue to have that as a virtual option for all of our students. And hopefully that can help us um, 
um, take down some of the anxiety about coming into office. And we were kind of doing that by talking to them on the phone. But now we're going to be more intentional because, um, again, I have students working two or three jobs. Everybody can't come in office, but we can we can talk to you over Microsoft Teams, you know, so we're going to do that. Um, our STEM campus, we've um, that pantry has not had as many shoppers, so that's our Meredith campus, as the Kennesaw campus. So what we're going to do is off, keep doing the shopping order option for our STEM campus and see if that could be something um, and help them to um, continue to, um, um, you know, shop and in a virtual way and see if that would encourage them to increase their shopping visits. Um, so outreach, we are going to continue to be on those broader social media platforms. Like I said, Reddit and Wildfire and monitor those in a much more intentional way. All and right. Any final questions? Yep, we still have a few questions. Um, we have 10 minutes left, so I'll get through some of them. Someone had asked um, if you have an emergency fund, and if so, is it a loan that students need to pay back? Um, no, there is that option through financial aid, but this is separate from that. So with our emergency assistance process through, financial, for our, through the financial hardships program, um, that's really looking at what dollars they still qualify for. We've had students who hadn't, Oh, like we just had a student who didn't do their FAFSA right, and so they were paying for school and struggling. And the, and the, you know, the associate director of um, financial aid who sits on our financial hardship committee was like, if they would just do this, finish the application, we we could do some things. And so just fixing those kind of things, um, you know, there is where you can have a um, um, like an override because you've experienced some type of unusual circumstance. Um, and so they're looking, and so we're walking students through that to talk about, you know, do a special circumstances um, um, paperwork so that they can get their FAFSA modified and they can go from um, dependent to independent. Um, there are different funds out there, um, SEOG, please do not ask me what it all stands for, but I know it's a grant um, that is through financial aid. And so sometimes there's still SEOG funds that our, uh, financial aid administrators still ask access to. Um, so, but once they get those dollars, um, usually we have seen that as help. But again, we funnel everything to the birth star. We never give any students cash in hand. Um, the only thing closest to that is, it, is, is the gift card. Um, and we still have them sign a, a, a form of that understanding that you are supposed to pur purchase this for the intended purposes. Um, but um, the money that we give through KSU Cares, the rental assistance, those are donated dollars. And no, we never ask for the students to reimburse us or refund us. I just tell them to pay it forward. So somebody helped you, now you help someone else when you can. Great. Um, someone asked, have students voiced a desire to participate in advocacy or civic action either around student homelessness or other social concerns they've experienced? Yes, student power is the best power. So um, we have um, a group, a student organization that is connected to, our, to CARE. Um, and so they, um, Owls Against Hunger, and so they do work on a lot of different hunger initiatives. Um, we do not manage the uh, pantry, um, for the clothing pantry on campus. Um, that was started by students, and so we support them. And so the director of that program is now an alum um, and, 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 and is continuing to work on it. And so um, she's actually going to become next month in May a, um, a full-time AmeriCorps VISTA assigned to do exactly what she created, the OWL swap. Um, clothing pantry, so I'm excited to be able to do that for her. I also serve as her mentor. Um, so it is great. I always try to encourage our students to be advocates. Um, I will say our current Kennesaw Campus pantry that we have was because of student advocacy. Um, it was an office that students used and they weren't using it anymore, and they said, we want, they said, we'll give up this office only if you give it to CARE. Um, so students have a lot of great power. Um, I would say Oregon State University, um, their whole program um, up there serving homeless students 
uh, was started by students and is managed by a student, um, a student government association. And like I just talked to some great students at UGA recently in Arizona State. Um, have a wonderful young lady who was in, um, in North Carolina, um, who are doing, who are trying to do some great, great work. I think it's harder for students um, because students graduate and everybody's not like the student that I have at KSU who I was like, hey, I'll just get you a VISTA position and make you a VISTA so you can stay and live your dream for the next year. Um, so I think it's harder for students because because uh, of the transitional nature of it that you know transition nature of being a student so i think it's helpful if they can get a strong strong advisor or someone on the campus to be their campus champion to keep that um, momentum going through those transition periods from student to student but i love working with students all right and so are there any ways that you wish your state higher ed agency could ease some barriers or increase access to support and your phone broke up. Say it again. Oh, are there ways that you wish your state higher ed agency could ease barriers or increase access to supports? Okay. Yeah. Um, I would love um, all the schools and all the state schools in Georgia to have a what we call designated point of contact. That's not volunteer. That is a part of their um, mandate as their job on that campus and at least be able to donate no less than 50% of their time to these efforts. Um, and the reason why is um, because I think that would make sure that we, people, because what in Georgia we have our Embark network um, and our designated point of contacts are phenomenal. We have them all over the state and all of our uh, technical schools who do have this as a part of their jobs, but our four-year um, colleges and universities do do this kind of like in addition to their, their normal job description. Um, but, you know, I just love that we have people who have come together. We we met last week virtually to support each other. Um, I, I emailed back and forth today with um, Lisa from Columbus State. Um, you know, we're all doing this great work, but it would be great if it was, you know, carved out and said, this is your job. Um, however that looks on that campus, but they could, that would be one way. Um, another way, um, I think with, you know, looking at all the different laws that are going out across the country, um, some schools do have where um, homeless students have um, proprietary treatment when it comes to housing or different things of that nature. And so looking at how we can, in our state, um, just be more intentional, you know, like how we have the question on the admissions application for KSU. And so I think a couple of the schools have gotten it advocated and added. We shouldn't have to do that. Can we just ask that question so we know who's coming in um, and be able to support those students as they're coming in? Because, hey, they made it to college. Well, let's support them, you know, from day one, from, you know, you know, from, from the door to the graduation um, to their future life. Um, so, uh, I think those are different ways, you know, having that designated point of contact mandated, um, but but also having um, things that in increase access. Um, but then, and then if you increase access, that's why you need a designated support point of contact to make sure that there's a support and the resources are there. Um, and I would hope funding would come with that to support them at least from a sense of you know being able to support their work, their efforts, their time, their salary, um, but then also encourage them to do, you know, through fundraising, um, have those resources on their campus where they can, you know, provide the resources and support to the students. Awesome. Thank you, Marcy. Um, someone also asked if they can get a copy of the pantry permission slip, and so I'll just ask them to email you out if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, just email me, um, and then, you know, if you go to our website, care.kennesaw.edu, um, some of the, you know, don't fill out the form, um, <laughs> but there are forms sitting there um, um, where students are accessing them, so if you just want to look, um, even our financial assistance um, program, financial hardships program, you can see, you can see what process we're taking the students to, but yes, please email. Awesome. Well, we still have a few more questions, so 
We'll be sure to pass those along to Marcy and get answers to you. Um, but we are getting towards the end of the presentation. I just wanted to go over really quickly some resources that are available, um, including the tip sheets for homeless youth that highlight some of the best practices that colleges and universities are doing. We have definitely highlighted Kennesaw State and Marcy a few times. So again, thank you so much for coming to this webinar and um, sharing what you're doing, Marcy, both for the students every day, but also especially right now in light of the coronavirus. Um, and again, for folks that are joining, if y'all are doing really unique and innovative work to support this population, please send me an email. Um, we'd love to feature your work in either the tip sheets or on the webinar. Here is both of our contact information. Um, again, if you want to receive any of the slips or assessment forms that Marcy talked about, feel free to email her right there. But with that, thank you all so much for joining us today. Please stay safe, everyone. And thank you again, Marcy.